I'll get started. <clears throat> First off, I'd like to say hello. My name is Dusty Mabe. Uh, I work uh, with the Fedora project quite a bit. I'm employed by Red Hat and I uh, focus mostly on Fedora Core OS and Fedora Cloud. And I'm going to talk about uh, Fedora Core OS, what's now and what's next. So in today's talk, I'm going to uh, briefly talk about what was, which was Container Linux and Atomic Host. I'm going to talk about what, what's now and then what's coming uh, next. I'm also going to try to answer some questions. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think I have a lot of time for demo, um, but I'm not sure if people want to stick around afterwards in the room. If we don't get kicked out, uh, I can do a brief demo for people and have people ask questions as I go. So first of all, what was? Uh, so what was, uh, what used to exist was uh, Container Linux and Atomic Host. They were both container-focused operating systems. Um, container Linux was based on Gentoo and Atomic Host was based on Fedora slash RHEL uh, and used RPMs as input. Uh, Container Linux uh, had an A-B partition scheme for updates, so um, used an image-based update strategy, and Atomic Host used RPM OS tree as technology. Uh, and then Container Linux used Ignition for provisioning, and Atomic Host had Anaconda slash CloudInit, um, so Anaconda for bare metal install type uh, workflow, and then CloudInit for anything in the cloud that started with an image. So that's what existed. But what, what do we have now? Uh, so now we have Fedora Core OS, which is an emerging Fedora edition. Um, and Fedora Core OS came from putting these two communities together. So Core OS, uh, the company's uh, container Linux, and then also Project Atomic's Atomic Host. Uh, this mostly was facilitated by the purchase of Core OS, the company, by Red Hat. Uh, but we've, uh, we've been harmonizing ever since. Um, but what does Fedora Core OS do? What is it comprised of? So Fedora Core OS incorporates the Container Linux uh, philosophy, the Container Linux provisioning stack, and the Container Linux cloud native expertise. Um, and it also incorporates the Atomic Host uh, foundation on top of Fedora, uh, the update stack from Atomic Host, and also enhanced security with SC Linux. Um, I want to take a brief uh, moment and talk a little bit about the philosophy behind, behind Container Linux because you'll see a lot of it ring true uh, when I switch over here in just a second and talk a little bit more about uh, the high-level features of Fedora Core OS. Uh, first of all, Container Linux uh, had a philosophy of automatic updates by default, which means that uh, there's no, by default, there's no interaction for administrators um, in order to stay up to date which typically means that systems uh, are, you know, have security fixes applied in a more, um, you know, timely manner and in general just don't get forgotten about and uh, open to CVEs for a very long time. Um, another philosophy that they have was basically all nodes start from around the same starting point. Uh, so they use Ignition to provision a node wherever it started, whether it be a bare metal node or uh, in the cloud which is interesting. Um, they also take immutable infrastructure to heart. Uh, so in general, if you need a change, let's update our configuration and reprovision. Uh, this is a lot easier in a cloud native environment than say on a, in bare metal, uh, but that was kind of the path at which they were coming from. And it tends to make a lot of sense in today's world. Um, and then also from the perspective of uh, host updates, have our users run software in containers. Um, that way they depend less on the host and your host updates are less likely to break you and break your application. So now let's talk about Fedora Core OS features and you'll see a lot of that container Linux philosophy come through here. The first one being automatic updates. So Fedora Core OS features automatic updates by default. Um, the in order to deliver automatic updates, they need to be reliable updates, right? We uh, we can't have systems randomly breaking and sysadmins, you know, getting paged and stuff in the middle of the night or whenever the update decides to come through. Uh, usually in the old model without automatic updates, um, there would be some sort of plan involved. Oh, I'm going to update X systems 
uh, and I'll be around in case something goes bad, right? With automatic updates, they need to be reliable. We don't want to break people. Um, so we basically have extensive tests in our automated CI pipelines. Every time a build uh, gets created, every time a PR gets opened, we test things. Um, but you know, there's things that we can't catch with tests. Sometimes that happens. So we also have several update streams to preview what is coming. Uh, so users can run those update streams and preview what's coming and they know if something's gonna break them. Um, the other thing that we have in place to kind of help our updates be more reliable are manage upgrade rollouts. So basically when we start an upgrade, it won't get, go to everybody immediately. It will go to everybody over a period of time, call it 24, 48 hours, um, you know, three days, four days, we can, we can control how long we want the update to roll out. And that means that it's a window over time, different people are gonna get the update. And if some of the early people that win the lottery um, get the update and it, it breaks them, they can let us know and we can stop the update rollout to, to do some investigation before we let the, the rest of the uh, people in the window update. Um, but, you know, sometimes things will go wrong. So when they do, we have RPM OS3 rollback, which can be used to go back. And uh, in the future, we have an automated, we, we want to have automated rollbacks so a user can specify you know, when we, boot my, when we boot our system into a new update, run these three checks, and if they don't pass, then I want you to go back and, you know, maybe send me an email or something. I'm not sure. But the idea there is that if somehow the application is affected by the update, we can automatically go back and it's not panic mode. Um, so, okay, I want to talk a little bit more about multiple update streams. So uh, we have... Uh, three update streams that we offer to users. One is next, one is testing, one is stable. Next is kind of experimental features or, uh, you know, like Fedora major rebases. So like when Fedora 33 beta comes out, um, you know, we would try to rebase to that pretty soon and get feedback on things that, you know, need to be looked at there. Testing itself is a preview of what's coming to stable. Um, so, that is basically a point in time snapshot of the Fedora stable RPM content. And then after a period of time, we will promote that to the stable uh, stream, which is the most reliable stream offered. The goals here are to publish new releases into the update streams at approximately a two week cadence. And then also to really hope to find issues in next and testing streams before they hit stable. We don't want to break people in stable. Um, this is kind of a complicated slide. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but uh, down here, essentially, I'll, I'll run through, um, you know, how our update promotion works. So this is essentially the Yum Bodhi, you know, Yum repositories, and it goes, it updates with time. So at a point in time, we'll essentially take a snapshot of what is in the stable repositories, and we will build a testing stream uh, you know, build off of that. Let's call it uh, 31 2020 So March 23rd. Um, and then we'll release it. And after two weeks, there's a two week period in here where hopefully nobody finds issues. But if they do, then we basically will uh, bump testing and and go again. But if nobody finds issues, then after two weeks, we promote that content to stable. So we have a lot of control here, uh, which is very useful. Okay, so the next feature I wanna talk about is automated provisioning. So Fedora Core OS uses Ignition, uh, like Container Linux did, to automate provisioning. Any logic for a machine's lifetime is kind of encoded in the config, in the Ignition config. So it's very easy to automatically reprovision nodes. I actually had something like this hit me earlier this year where I lost uh, connectivity to a box that was sitting in the in, on my desk in the Red Hat office, but uh, because of COVID, we were not allowed to get into the office. So I took the same ignition config that I had used to provision that node and spun up a VM locally uh, on my desktop here at home, and I was back up and running. Um, and also with ignition, uh, we start at the same starting point, whether we're on bare metal or cloud. 
So you can really use Ignition everywhere as opposed to having to have two different strategies uh, for provisioning, whether you're on bare metal or um, you know in the cloud. Um, and a little bit more detail about Ignition, it's a declarative JSON uh, file, essentially. It runs exactly, uh, or during the boot process, um, Ignition runs exactly once and it can write files, it can do system to units, users, groups, partition disks, it can do some complicated things. Uh, but in general, if you provided an ignition config that is either invalid or uh, you know, a part of it fails for whatever reason, the boot will not continue, uh, which means you don't get any half provision systems, which can you know, kind of be com confusing if, uh, if you get a system that's kind of working, so it doesn't fail health checks for whatever reason, but there's part of it that uh, actually didn't get configured correctly, and you find out much later. Um, and you know, because ignition configs are more machine friendly and not really uh, pretty to look at or to edit, we have a, uh, another tool called Fedora Core OS Config Transpiler, which is used to translate um, you know, a human friendly uh, YAML format into Ignition JSON, but it's not just a YAML to JSON converter. There's also quite a few little helpers in there um, that will generate, uh, you know, ign valid Ignition for you with a much smaller syntax. And um, it's it also has some distribution specific stuff. So, for example, if uh, we were to take Ignition and run it on um, OpenSUSE, they might have some more distribution specific things that they want to add in their own config transpiler. Uh, Ignition is meant to be kind of distro agnostic. Um, but yeah, so the next feature I want to talk about is cloud native and container focus. So software runs in containers. Um, so we have either the Podman or Moby Engine container runtimes. Moby Engine is uh, Docker. And uh, it's ready for cluster deployments. Because we're using Ignition, you can spin up 100 nodes and have them join a cluster. Um, so kind of bursty type cloud uh, ability. And then spin them down when they're no longer needed. Um, and as far as you know, being available across many platforms, right now we have Alibaba, AWS, Azure, DigitalOcean, Exascale, GCP, OpenStack, Bolter, uh, VMware, and KVM images, QMU images. We're also adding IBM Cloud, uh, Vexhost, a uh, number of others. So we are looking to try to be everywhere. Uh, the next feature is OS versioning and security. This one I like quite a bit, especially as somebody who looks at a lot of bug reports. Um, so Fedora Core OS uses RPM OS tree, which I like to describe as Git for your operating system, uh, which means you know there's a single content hash, like a git hash that defines um, you know, every build that you've done. It defines a set of content. So uh, in this example, this 86C0246 is a short hash that basically says, this is a set of content. And we also have a, a little slightly more meaningful version number that's associated with it, which I, I like to think of as a tag. But there's a version number associated with a, with a content hash, and that single identifier tells you all of the software that was in the release. And so you as a user, you can share that information with me or with one of uh, the, the community members for Fedora Core OS, and you can say, hey, I, I'm seeing this behavior when I boot this release. Um, you know, Is this a bug? And then we can actually take that exact same version, deploy it, and try it out, see if we see a bug, uh, which is very powerful. Um, with RPM OS tree, we also have read-only file system mounts, which kind of prevents accidental OS corruption. So if you are MRF with a glob and accidentally try to delete things you shouldn't, it will prevent that. And then also, you know, non-sophisticated attacks um, from modifying the system. But then we also have SC Linux for other things like, uh, you know, if, a, if you have an application in a container that gets compromised, uh, hopefully it can't access anything else on the host and can only do things to the container. Okay, so what's in the OS? Um, so basically, latest and greatest in Fedora. Uh, and then we have the hardware support, so whatever the kernel supports pretty much. Uh, we have basic administration tools, uh, Podman, Moby. Um, we do not have Python. Um, part of the goal here, uh, 
was to, you know, encourage people to use containers for the app their applications. And Python is a really good escape hatch for uh, just spinning something up really fast. But it also means that the user then depends on the host version of Python and the libraries that are on the host in order to run that application. And we want the flexibility to be able to remove things from the host or add them to the host and not worry about every user that exists uh, for that particular uh, library. So it, it, it's just much more reliable for us to do updates if things are running in a container. Okay, um, so Fedora Core OS has been used in several other projects so far uh, that build on top of it. One of them is OKD, um, so which is the upstream of OpenShift OCP. Uh, and in OKD, it's kind of interesting because the cluster controls the OS upgrades uh, with the machine config operator. And the cluster essentially knows a lot about uh, the operating system. It's tied to Fedora Core OS. So when you, uh, you know, when you spin up a new node of, um, of OpenShift, the cluster can actually manage that, select the right uh, image for Fedora Core OS for this version of, of OKD, and bring it up in, you know, if you're using a cloud GCP or something like that, for example, it knows the, the, the image to use. If you're bringing your own, you know, you'll have to spin up uh, the version of Fedora Core OS, but then if it happens to be the wrong version, uh, the cluster will actually rebase it to the correct version for OKD. That's kind of interesting. Um, we also have a community uh, um, Kubernetes distribution called Typhoon that has Fedora Core OS as a base option. And uh, Dalton Helpful in that community has done a great job with that. And we also have the OpenStack Magnum project, which uses used Atomic Host and now uses Fedora Core OS as the base OS for, uh, for the Magnum project that delivers Kubernetes to OpenStack users. Um, I want to talk briefly about Fedora Core OS and the relationship to RHEL Core OS. Uh, so basically, common tooling and components, but different scope and purpose. Um, so RHEL Core OS is not intended to be used as a standalone OS, where Fedora Core OS is. Um, so Container Linux basically could be used as a standalone OS or in a cluster, uh, which Fedora Core OS supports very nicely. RHEL Core OS is much more targeted at OpenShift. Um, so for example, OpenShift components, some OpenShift components are delivered as part of the base OS. Um, so much more focused in scope on that one. Uh, the other differences, RHEL Core OS is based on a RHEL package set, Fedora Core OS based on a Fedora package set. Um, RHEL Core OS is updated and configured by the cluster operators from OpenShift, similar to how I described OKD just a minute ago. And uh, Fedora Core OS, obviously we have the, uh, the updates flow that I described earlier. Other than that, there's really not much difference between them. Uh, very similar content sets of, other than the, the OpenShift slash Kubernetes pieces that are baked into the OS for RHEL Core OS. Uh, they're all built using Core OS Assembler. Uh, we have very similar pipelines, although we're looking to kind of make those even more similar in the future. Um, but that's it for Fedora Core OS and RHEL Core OS. Uh, now I want to talk briefly about, you know, kind of what we have coming down the pipe. Um, so what we have coming down the pipe, we, we want more cloud platforms, like I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, I, IBM Cloud is one that we have most support for, but we are not yet producing uh, cloud images for them. Um, we're adding just a few more uh, bits that are missing, and then we want to start putting those on the website as well. Um, and then platforms like Packet and other things that, uh, that are miss missing from that list. A multi-arch support. So we have a proof of concept right now for adding ARM64 to our pipeline, and hopefully that will prove out the model uh, for us to get uh, PowerPC and also S390X added to the platform as well. Um, we also want to add more human-friendly helper functions to Fedora Core OS Config Transpiler. One example today is, um, for some reason, it's just really, <laughs> it's really not ergonomic in order to change the kernel, kernel uh, command line for one of your nodes. You kind of have to write a service that runs a, 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 a RPM OS tree command. It's just not very human friendly. So what we'd like is to be able to kind of hook into our Fedora Core OS config and have a user very easily say, hey, I want this kernel argument to be different than what the default is and have that 
plumbed through all the way um, to have the running node get that applied when it's done. Um, so little things like that are things that we want, really want to uh, improve the, the user experience for. Uh, another one, user experience host extensions. So I mentioned earlier, we, we kind of want to uh, guide people towards um, not package layering um, and using containers, but package layering is great for things that aren't easy to containerize and or um, you know maybe little tiny host utilities or something like that. The experience there is great when it works, but sometimes it doesn't because of the difference in our package sets between um, you know what's in latest Fedora stable. Uh, so we're working on with RHEL Engine Infra on that to, to make that better. And then also more improved documentation. We had a hack fest yesterday that we, uh, we um, got a lot of people to join, translations, uh, added documentation, fixing bugs in our documentation, things like that. And tighter integrations with OKD and other upstream projects as well. Um, this is my call to get involved. So use Fedora Core OS. Um, go grab it from the website, open issues um, on the issue tracker. We have our forum as well. If you have you know, questions and aren't sure um, how to do something, feel free to ask us there. We have a mailing list and we also have our, uh, our IRC channel. Cool, I'll open it up for questions. And you know, if people wanna stick around after questions, I know I'm running out of time. I've got um, you know, demo content too. So if enough people are around and want to hang out, I'll, I'll do a demo. And I guess I'll just look at the chat in order to see if there are questions. <laughs> so James, you had a question about stats for number of users. Um, so what we have right now, um, we have kind of like a, a, I don't know if the metrics is the right word. <laughs> we have a, a proof of concept of a service that basically will gather some, you know, not specific information about a machine, like, uh, you know, not user specific or anything, like the version that it's currently on. Um, and maybe the architecture or something like that. I can't remember, uh, but we don't have that service deployed yet, um, but we definitely would like to. So one of the goals with that service is to be able to actually get some insight into how many nodes are up to date, how many nodes are old. Um, you know, For example, if we're going through a rollout window, we'll actually be able to see if nodes failed to update. Um, and so rather than waiting for users to give us feedback about, hey, this failed and, you know, in this way, we can start to see in that rollout window if, uh, if you know, 10% of our systems are failing to upgrade for some reason, we need to pause this rollout and start to figure out what the problem with that update is because, you know, we don't, we don't want that level of uh, failure at all. So we don't have anything right now. Uh, but we have plans for that. Yep, uh, Fedora Core OS is definitely intended to be used for a home, you know, server, single container if you want. Um, so I, I actually have a demo that I can give uh, for that specific case here in just a minute. If, um, you know, if, if they don't kick us out in 20 seconds, I don't know how this works really, so. If they kick us out, then grab me and I'll send you a link to where I also did the demo one other time. Okay, Neil says that we have it as long as we want, so. And looks like Jim is looking for example ignition configs. So Jim, we actually are doing a workshop tomorrow. Um, and the, the workshop content is actually on our documentation um, page. Uh, so if you can't come to the workshop, uh, then you can still go here to the tutorial section of our documentation and execute it yourself. Um, but it has a lot of examples of ignition configs that you can use. Um, so like here's one 
this, actually, for the most part, we we define things in uh, you know the Fedora CoreOS config transpiler um, config format, I guess. Um, but typically, you'll start here with a more human friendly config format, and then you'll run a tool that basically spits out ignition for you. Um, so there's a lot of examples in that documentation. Uh, I'd encourage you to check that out. And then if you have any specific questions or something's not working for you, we have the uh, discussion forum, which is a great place to, to kind of, you know, engage the community. So Will says, Yeah, so the CoreOS updates don't actually go through Mirror Manager. Um, well, I take that back. It's slightly more nuanced than that. I think uh, we do have some sort of um, meta link URL type thing, but I don't think the mirrors, the Mirror Manager actually may do that. No content is on the mirrors, but our, our clients still talk to the mirror server, like the master one. Um, so yeah. You know, we might be able to do something there as well. Um, regarding ButterFS, um, you know, we don't really have any plans there. Uh, you know, we've been mostly getting Fedora CoreOS off the ground. Uh, but, you know, even if we don't have uh, ButterFS be like the default that is shipped, uh, one of the things that we've been doing with Ignition is making, um, you know, adding in support for being able to uh, do root on, you know, complex root devices. So like RAID and, you know, doing things like encryption. Um, and as part of that, you essentially need to be able to do whatever you want to to the root file system. Uh, so you can uh, switch that out and, you know, switch the file system if you want. It's not there yet, uh, but yeah, you should be able to run it on ButterFS in the future if you want to. It just might not be the default. And Jonathan has a link to an example of doing that. But yeah, some of the code enablement, I think, is still uh, in the works. OK, uh, does anybody want to see a demo? Yes, demo. Okay, let's try this out. All right. Uh, I think this is the one we want to see. Okay, can everybody see? Is the text big enough? I think I tested this earlier and people were saying it was okay. Okay, cool. All right, so I mentioned briefly in the presentation that earlier this year, you know, I lost access to a machine. I think the I think the office lost power briefly, and the little box that was sitting on my desk did not have in the BIOS configured to automatically turn back on when it gets power. Uh, so it was powered down, and I had no way to get to it. So it is actually my WeChat client that I just SSH into and run Tmux um, on. So I had previously put everything. Um, you know, all the configuration for that client in an ignition config and, and a container. And so I was able to spin that up on my desktop in about 10 minutes after I figured out I didn't have access to my uh, other box. So no downtime. Uh, well, short downtime. Anyway, I've recreated an example um, for this to try to go through and show people, you know, one thing that you can do uh, with uh, Fedora Core OS, which is a, kind of a focused use case. So what I have here is Dusty Mabe's WeChat config that runs in Tmux via systemd in a container. And that's kind of complicated, but it uh, it's kind of an interesting way to, to do things. But what I have is uh, instructions here for creating an ignition config uh, based on a Fedora Core OS config, um, and then also instructions for how to test it using uh, a virtual machine, but what we have here is a Fedora Core OS config, and it basically adds in, um, you know, uh, an authorized key for the core user. Uh, one thing it does is it 
runs a service called set service, which basically uh, enables the container managed C group SE Boolean. This is needed because I run systemd inside my container. Um, it has another service called WeChat service, which is what essentially runs the container that starts systemd inside the container that then runs Tmux. Um, and if you'll notice, this particular service uh, runs after another service called build WeChat service. I didn't want to build this and host it in a container registry. It's not it's not that complicated and it's not going to get pulled that much. Um, so I just wanted to build it locally on the node. Um, and I have another service called build WeChat service that uh, you know pulls uh, Fedora thirty two and then just runs build um, against a uh, a set of files that are local to the node, which I populate a little further down. Um, so here, let's see. Home core WeChat build is something that uh, is defined inside of the container directory within this repository. Uh, so if I look at the container directory, there's a Docker file. In here, I install WeChat along with uh, Tmux and systemd. Um, and I essentially run, uh, have a start script that I hand to WeChat that tells it to configure everything. So usually with WeChat, what you do is you start it up and you configure a bunch of stuff and then it, this, this configuration is saved in your home directory or something like that. So this is a container and I, I don't, you know, I want it to automatically be able to come back up wherever I am if I blow it away and start it new. Um, so I crafted a short start script, which basically adds, uh, this is an example, obviously mine is a lot more complicated, but this one adds Freenode as a server, sets my nickname to be Dusty Demo, joins Fedora Meeting 1, uh, the IRC channel, and then connects. Um, and that is pretty much all it does. Let's see. Oh, there's a, oh, sorry. Yeah, there's a WeChat.service that starts inside the container. This is started via systemd. And all it does is run tmux, um, and it calls WeChat, and it runs this start script. So let's see it go. So this is the readme. Oh. So I'm going to run it. So if we take that uh, Fedora Core OS config, pipe it through FCCT. We see this ignition config, and you can kind of see ignition is much less easy to read um, than your FCCT configs. Um, you know, for one, it kind of encodes some things, and it's just not as fun. Uh, so we've got our WeChat config, and now I can essentially take and start a virtual machine if I just wanted to test it before I actually put it on that bare metal node that I have. Um, so I can spin it up. For some reason, that always takes longer when I'm doing a demo than it does otherwise. But uh, if you'll notice, some things we try to do with Fedora Core OS are, you know, help the user along with information. Um, so one thing that we do is we output uh, information about, you know, like your IP address. Um, this might be useful in a cloud environment um, where you, you might not know for some reason what the IP is or, you know, whatever. That's, uh, that can be kind of useful. Uh, the, also, the host keys, if you want to validate that you're talking to the right uh, machine. Um, we also output information about, uh, you know, 
was Ignition able to actually get a config and also did it have any SSH keys that were added? If that, you know, if it happened to not have any SSH keys that were added, then you might have trouble getting into the node, right? So that might be another tip on whether the actual um, deployment or provisioning went as you thought it would. So let's go and let's get into this node. Okay, so I'm in the node. One thing you'll notice is we are on uh, Fedora Core West. This, the, that's the latest stable release uh, right now. And, you know, there's information about our issue tracker and our discussion board. Um, let's see, right now, the build WeChat service is uh, still running. So that container build is still kind of going. If we want to look at that, um, I think we should be able to see uh, stuff that's kind of coming to the screen as a result of that container build. So it's it's kind of progressing through its uh, its build, but while while we wait on that, we can go look at um, kind of uh, some other files that were laid down on the system. So this file in user local bin WeChat is one that I wrote in here that basically says I can log into this system, and if I just run WeChat. I'll be able to get into the environment that I expect, which is to get into the WeChat container and just tmux attached to the ex existing session that's already running. So let's see. All right, so let's see. Get into it now. And we are in to the container. Looks like it's still connecting. Yep. So now I can say, and that's pretty much it. So that is an example of having all of your configuration baked into your node uh, or into your ignition config and just having your system come up and do everything you want it to. Um, the only other demo I can really show right now is um, uh, Fedora Core OS and the relationship with OKD. So I brought up a cluster earlier. Um, it takes a little while to bring up a cluster, so I wasn't going to do it during a demo, but I brought up a cluster earlier. You can see I have uh, five con or three control plane nodes and two worker nodes. And I'm going to use a tool called K9s, uh, which is kind of like a text user interface to view um, Kubernetes clusters. Um, so this is an OKD cluster. I've got a bunch of cluster operators. Looks like one of them is degraded for some reason, but I don't think that one's important. Um, but one thing that's nice about OKD is I can look at these uh, nodes that exist in the cluster and I can pull up information about them. And this, uh, partic this you know, OKD itself knows about the OS image that's in the cluster. So it knows it's running Fedora Core OS, right? And um, it also knows how to bring up new nodes in the cluster. So if I go look at the machine sets for, for this machine, I only brought up this cluster with two worker nodes. And I can do something like, oh, just spin up a new worker node for me in this uh, you know, D zone. And so what I'll do is I'll go in and edit that and I'll search for replicas. Um, and I will spin up a new one. So we can see that the count changed and we can also uh, see that there's a new node that's being spun up right now um, that is in US East 1D for GCP. Uh, so different availability zone. And eventually that node will join the cluster and it will show up right here in the list of nodes. Um, so that's pretty much it for the demo. Do we have any, uh, any other questions that I can answer? So 
we have a question uh, for um, Ignition. Does it mean that every configuration change means reboot of the server? I think it depends. Like, obviously, you can kind of evaluate how valuable um, how valuable the reboot would be. For example, you know, if you if you make a change to your application, then I don't you know not unless your configuration for your application is delivered via ignition and not updated any other way. For example, you know, um, in some cases you might do uh, reach out to source control and grab a new version of your application or, or a new config setting or something like that. Um, you know, obviously you probably don't need to rerun ignition for that. If you're changing networking or something like that, um, you know, you could want to rerun ignition just because you know, what if you applied it to the node using Network Manager in MCLI or something like that, but then later, and then also at the same time, tried to apply that uh, configuration via Ignition, but you didn't test it. Um, and then, you know, three months later, when you when that node has trouble and you try to spin up a new one, um, you know, whatever configuration that you applied and didn't test doesn't work and you have to figure everything out. So. It really depends on you and how valuable you think that is. Obviously, you can do things to the systems, um, but you know if if there's low cost to spin up a brand new system, uh, obviously cloud environments make it really easy. Bare metal, not not as easy, right? Maybe you have Pixie, and and that makes things a lot a lot easier. But uh, if it's a low cost to bring up new systems, I would recommend that you reprovision. Let's see. Okay, uh, how do I deal with auto update of containers running in this in this demo, like the WeChat one that I did? Um, I'm going to assume that. So for the WeChat one, the the demo that I did was a little simplified, but in the one that I actually have running, um, I have it periodically. Uh, basically try to pull a new Fedora 32 container and then also build from a Git repository. Um, so for example, once a week, it'll try to do a new build. And if there's nothing new to build, it won't do it. Uh, but if there is something new to build, then it will do that. And then the next time uh, my Fedora core OS box gets updated, which happens roughly every two weeks, I'll get the new WeChat um, container that'll be used to start it. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm gonna, you know, stop presenting and all, but I'll hang out in the in the chat uh, for a little bit. But thanks for everybody for coming, and I appreciate uh, you joining the talk. And we have a workshop tomorrow, uh, so if you're interested in getting your hands on um, with Fedora Core OS, feel free to come to that. If not, it's on the website or on the docs page, so you can um, you can execute that whenever you like. Thanks, everybody.